Hi, and good afternoon. Welcome back to the Water Pavilion here at COP26. We are coming from uh, coming from coming at you from Glasgow live and direct um, on this day, which is dedicated completely to finance and importantly accelerating investment in water solutions for a net zero resilient future. Uh, we're now moving on to our fourth or fifth session of the day. It's been a very busy morning, and as you may be able to hear around me, it's a very busy pavilion space. Um, we have our next speaker, which is uh, it will be introduced by Kari Davis, the Technical Director for the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. And her session is titled Macroeconomic Resilience, Making Water Sensitive Strategic Choices for Growth. She has a fabulous set of speakers, um, and I will allow her to introduce them to you. Over to you, Kari. and expert on water and climate um, from the Netherlands um, and so we're in this session macroeconomic resilience making water sensitive strategic choices for growth um, so what we will be talking about today uh, in this session is um, um, well economies are, are depending on water to a large extent and so if we see especially climate change uh, influencing the water situation will be less water, will be more water. Um, and there's a lot of <clears throat> uncertainty around that. Um, so how can we make sure that <clears throat> water keeps supporting the economy? And um, how can we ensure that like economic investments take into account what is happening in the water, um, water domain? So we have a, we have a great, set of lineup of very interesting speakers um very short overview what we will have today we have a keynote uh we have some case studies and some closing remarks unfortunately we have a very short session so we don't have time for questions and answers but if you have any question or, or suggestion or you want to make a comment or whatever please send an email to me yos.timmerman at waterframes.nl and make sure to get back to you as soon as possible. So um, this session was organized by a partnership, the Water Resilience for Economic Resilience Partnership, uh, which among others partners, uh, the Rijkswaterstaat from, from the Netherlands, Agra, World Bank, uh, GIZ, Resilience Shift, OECD, Wetlands International, ADB, World Bank. So we have a, a, a great group of people behind this uh, this initiative and th this is just one step in trying to get this uh, this link between water and economy uh, to a better um, yeah to a better uh, step um, how can we make sure that that we are resilient in the future so um, we have our keynote first today is Kathleen Dominic She's the program lead on financing water security at the OECD and manages the Roundtable on Financing Water, um, which is a dedicated platform to engage policymakers and the finance and investment community. So very well um, fit for, for this keynote. So please, I give the floor to Kathleen Dominique. Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jos. And hello, everyone. Greetings. Um, good to be back here on this uh, important topic. Um, to get going, I'm going to share my slides. And please let me know if you can not see them. I think uh, that's working. I'm putting them in the full slideshow now. Okay, excellent. Um, so indeed, this is a very complex topic, uh, the notion of water resilience and how that contributes to economic resilience. Uh, we've had a series of uh, discussions and sessions throughout the year. And so this has been very productive to shine some light on that. Um, my remarks today are going to focus on, are going to draw on some ongoing current OECD work uh, in this space, and hopefully that can set a bit of a scene for uh, the interesting case studies that we have. Um, so to just uh, kick off, uh, and, and, and let me just say that, you know, I'd like to start a little bit with this discussion of what do we mean by uh, economic resilience before we get into the water resilience. And uh, what we see at the OECD is that uh, governments worldwide are increasingly realizing that systemic threats um, afflicting modern societies, including natural hazards, aging populations, global migration, 
these are compounded by their potential to disrupt interconnected um, economic systems, information systems, so, uh, social systems, and infrastructure systems that have lasting con consequences. And one of the important lessons learned from the global financial crisis in 2008 is that the drive for efficiency in economies and the elimination of redundancy that characterized the global financial system of the mid 2000s left the world exposed to systemic disruption. And that crisis provoked considerable reflection about conventional economic thinking. And for its part, the OECD launched a program uh, called the New Approaches to Economic Challenges, NIAC. And over the past decade plus, uh, they've been looking at new ways to think about how economies um, uh, operate, how they are interconnected, and uh, what that means for economic policymakers. Um, so indeed, one thing that has emerged out of those, um, I would say, soul-searching uh, efforts is really that resilience thinking is needed to inform uh, policies to lessen those long-term impacts of economic and financial disruptions posed by unpredictable events, whether that's the subprime loan crisis of 2008 or the pandemic that we are still living through or natural disasters or so on. So the point here is just to, to make a little bit of a contrast between uh, an efficiency approach and, and a resilience approach. And of course, when we're talking about water systems, natural and built infrastructure is complex and adaptive. It's, it's really a system and systems analysis is, is necessary. Um, we also make the point that efficiency and resilience in network systems, or at least short-term uh, efficiency, in network deficiency does not necessarily correlate to resilience. In fact, it usually doesn't. Um, so optimizing for one or the other will result in different system designs. And there, so there are some trade-offs there to consider between efficiency and resilience. And that's important for uh, investment strategies. When finance is focused on investing in water infrastructure efficiency, at least in a short-term perspective, that could result in, in a significant losses once unpredictable interruptions occur. Um, Water-related risks, uh, for their part, are systemic in nature. They're, they're important feedback loops. Um, they're complex. They are compounding, and they cascade over global, regional, and local networks. And so this highlights a need for network-based resilience approaches to successfully manage those risks and to target investments where they can achieve the most impact. And this has been a topic uh, of important discussion and focus in our um, meetings of the Roundtable on Finance and Water. Let me just say a quick word also about uncertainty, which you mentioned, Jos. Um, uh, this is highly important because it, it, despite advances in hydro uh, uh, climactic science, predicting the variability of water demand and supply precisely in a precise way remains a major challenge. Um, having a predict, a predict and then act approach to managing water systems can backfire under deeply uncertain conditions and eliminating risk entirely is neither physically nor economically feasible. Um, thus, we put the emphasis on saying that we want to avoid pursuing uh, an elusive kind of certainty through spurious rigor. Uh, this is really a fallacy and we have to really manage uh, for resilience and recognize there are going to be many things that we don't know and we can't uh, predict with uh, certainty. So that's focusing on how to improve the way the system performs under stresses and some of those indeed are going to be uh, quite uncertain. Um, and there are tools to address this uh, in terms of network science and some emerging um, approaches. I want to turn now to try to make some connections, more connections between uh, what we could mean by water resilience and economic resilience. And I want to give two perspectives, and I will be very brief. Um, one is a, what I call an inside out perspective. So this is looking at how investments in water systems can become more resilient and, and hence uh, contribute to economic resiliency. And the other perspective is really an outside in perspective and looking then at, so from the starting point of a, the global financial system and thinking about how water risk might create material financial impact. So indeed, I will try to be short. 
Um, the first perspective is really thinking about uh, what we call uh, strategic investment pathways. And in the context of water systems, these pathways refer to plan and adaptively manage sequences of investments in water infrastructure policies and, si and systems that aim to strengthen that, that long-term resiliency. And uh, in our work that we're developing, we really put the focus on designing pathways, not just thinking about financing individual bankable projects, but pathways or packages of investments in a way that fully reflect the value of water to the range of beneficiaries and, and maximize those benefits over the community. So that's the really the overarching goal to not think about projects as individual, but more as a package of solutions. And indeed, when we're talking about resilience, resilient water systems, we're thinking about three attributes in particular. One is persistence, the other is adaptability, and the third is transformability. So really the persistence is the ability to maintain a coherent normal function. The adaptability is the ability to maintain coherent function by modifying the design and operation to accommodate change. And transformability is then being able to transform the system into a new normal uh, once it's gone beyond tipping points. And I just want to say we have this work that we're developing now with um, Casey Brown of the University of Massachusetts and Fred Boltz of Resolute Design um, uh, Solutions, uh, looking at how we can actually model um, and provide some quantitative analytics to help inform the design of resilient uh, uh, pathways for resilient water systems. And this is just an example of what we could imagine as, as a support for informing those decisions where a selected investment in this inner interior blue box number, number one uh, shows the range of that investment's um, persistence under different climate scenarios, more or less warm, more wet, wetter or drier futures. Then you also see a broader range of where that investment would need to be adapted because it needs to actually adjust to changing conditions and then beyond that, we see that the system would actually have to transform in some, some way along a certain pathway, depending on those features. So that's a way to think about and visualize how uh, pathways of investments could adapt to and transform over time to different circumstances. Now, let me just shift to another uh, perspective. So that was really about thinking about how the financing we're putting into um, water-related investments could contribute to more um, resilient systems. And this one is the, the outside in perspective. So how water related risks could uh, potentially generate some financially material impacts on the system. And uh, this is interesting because we've just been starting some work in this area. And one thing that we've observed is as something we're calling, we call the materiality gap between uh, what can be observed as significant economic and social costs of water risks, which are well-documented, happening already today, expecting to be exacerbated in the future and rising, and their financial materiality in the global financial system. And what we see is just limited and emerging evidence for where those water risks actually create uh, material financial impacts. And there's probably several reasons for that. And one is there are significant limitations in current risk modeling and risk assessment approaches, whereby uh, we know that the evidence for, for and the data related to, to material financial impacts are, are quite limited. And um, in fact, uh, current modeling approaches do not actually account for those types of risks. And if they do, um, they're not fully priced. And in fact, this can mask uh, the impact of those risks. And really, new, there are new methods and, and analysis that are needed to, to um, spotlight that more clearly. A second reason for why there's this disconnect is that prudential regulations um, that regulate the financial sector don't explicitly refer to environmental risks. And finally, where material risks may arise, financial institutions can make use of a number of tools to hedge and to transfer those risks. Um, now, the point we want to underscore here is that the ignorance of risk is not equivalent to the absence of risk. And so uh, why do we think that this is important? Uh, let me just close on this uh, final point, um, which could be uh, one for, for further investigation. Um, 
this, these issues are quite uh, topical for both policymakers and financial institutions. Uh, indeed, for financial regulators, the issue is that material financial risk may be masked by current practices in the financial system. And that would mean that if and when those risks materialize, that the financial sector may not be equipped uh, to deal with them. Uh, also, some risks may not be material today, but could become so in the future. So the notion of dynamic materiality is an important one. Uh, we can't take for granted that uh, just because an assessment or a, a, a risk uh, modeling uh, tool doesn't deem certain risks material now doesn't mean that that's not going to change. We have to remember, remember this is a dynamic context. And then finally, this is, of course, important because if water risks are considered financially material, that could then impact the allocation of financing flows uh, towards water security. Uh, so with that, I know we don't have much time, uh, but I'd like to wrap up and just thank you for your attention and hand it back to Jos so we can hear from the interesting case studies that will uh, hopefully illustrate uh, further this uh, complex topic. Over to you. Thank you, Kathleen, for this uh, excellent overview of what we're working on and what we're looking for. Um, so with this bit more theoretical start, um, we are now going to try to look into several case studies where these ideas are more or less um, implemented. Um, but um, in the meanwhile, um, if you have any ideas or suggestions or questions, just please send me an email. Don't do it in the chat. I think the chat is disabled. Don't do it in the chat. Send an email to me. Um, and for the first case study, I would like to turn to Josefina Maestu. She's an economist with over 30 years of experience working and publishing mainly on water economics and policy, both nationally and internationally. And she was the director of the UN Office of the International Water Decade until 2015. And since 2018, she's the National Water Advisor of the Secretary of State of Environment of the Government of Spain where she's led the preparation of the Green Book for Water Governance and the Water Strategy for Ecological Transition. So a lot of experience here. And now she will inform us about Spain and the systemic water changes. So Josefina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting us, for inviting Spain to be here. And I'm going to try to, to go into the details of more and more practical case on what it means is what the resilience for economic resilience and how this is happening in a concrete case. Basically, uh, just to give you an overview, in Spain, uh, the productions is that the predictions are there is going to be a reduction of water availability of an average of 24% by the end of the century. So we have a big problem. In some of the regions, the reductions of the water availability will be, will be about 40%. So we need to do something about that. Um, more occurrence of five years droughts as well, like is happening in California. This is going to happen in Spain. It hasn't happened yet, but we, we see that this is, this is a trend that is, is happening. And, and also, this is not just something that is in the productions in predictions. We have seen it happening already. Uh, the last 20 years reductions in the different river basins is between 5% and 22.1% of reduction of water availability. So the problem is here and now. We also have a quite a stressed water system. So it's not only a question of the water availability, but how is our water use system? Um, basically, we have over exploitations of many aquifers with an increase by 30% of the use of groundwater uh, since 2008. We have 3.8 million of irrigated, irrigated agriculture hectares, and there's been an increase of 12% since 2020, 2010, and there is a lot of pressures to continue doing so with climate change, with less pluviometry, uh, more crops that were not uh, irrigated before are asking for more water. So this is one of the issues that obviously we have to deal with. How we have been dealing with these kind of problems in the past? Basically, we have dealt with this type of problems and the risks associated to recurrent droughts uh, by robust solutions for predictable risks. So we have a dam capacity of 40,000 cubic hectometers that uh, 
uh, the problem is now with the uh, redox pluviometry, they are not full. These dams are not full. So they are now below 40%, for example, today. Last week, the, the last um, reports from the, from the ministry were that our, our um, uh, dams were full by 39%. And in some of the river basins, like the Guadalquivir river basins, where Seville is uh, even below that. So we have a, a big problem. So what have been um, doing to increase our ability to cope? Basically, something that uh, Kathleen was saying, redundancy. Create some redundancy in the system. So we have been diversifying our water resources, diversifying risks, as one we say. And as you can see here in the, in the river basins, which are more to the Mediterranean area. Let me see if I can use this. Um, we have a mix of water supplies. So normally the cheapest water sources is always uh, surface water, dam, dam uh, uh, water. So as, 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 as soon as we get into those river basins which are more under pressure, the, what we are doing is to have different, a mix of water supplies, e each of them with different characteristics. You know, desalinization is more expensive, you know, it's more energy intensive, we know that, but it's more reliable and it's better quality. Okay, so how do we mix those resources to make it, to make our system more resilient? Uh, surface water is cheaper, but it's not, it's not highly reliable with, with climate change. So those are the, the type of issues that we are dealing with that. And in parallel with that, we are doing protecting drinking water resources and increasing wastewater treatment. And more recently, we are moving we don't have any choice, basically, towards a reduction of water use. So as, uh, the, the ones I was telling you before, basically, are supply solutions. Now we have to move into, into reduction of water use, uh, more importantly, into solutions that create co-benefits. And this is being, being done on an ad hoc basis. So it's still a local type of uh, driven um, solutions. A step four, a flood management that is more uh, scaled up at the level of the state. But most of this uh, focus on co-benefits, which also was being discussed by Kathleen, uh, is still something that uh, is happening more at the local level and, and more scattered. Uh, what we are really doing is, for example, limit uh, water use and reduce water allocated to users by 1,600 cubic hectometers, which is a lot of water. Okay, so that is happening. As we are already saying, that this water cannot be allocated to water users. That's a must. We are looking at the rebound effect of, of improved uh, technical water efficiency in, in irrigation technology. As you know, irrigation technology, uh, more efficient technology is supposed to save water. What we are finding in Spain is this is not really the case, so it's not always really the case. So we need to look into that. So those are the kind of, of policies that we are doing now. So how is water in the National Recovery and Resilient Plan, in the Next Generation Plan? Because what we want to see is how, what is the place of water in our national strategies for economic development and economic recovery. Uh, basically, the National Recovery Plan of Spain is 70,000 million euros. Uh, and there are two lines which are cross-cutting. One of them is the green investments, which is about 39%, so a lot of money goes to green investments. And the other one is the digital society, it's also cross-cutting. Cross Cutting, so it's 29%. What happens with water is what we have for water is 1,700 million euros. Um, basically, what we have in that plan is 10,000 hectares of wetlands, 3,000 kilometers of river restoration, wastewater treatment facilities, and very importantly, you know, helping the small municipalities, which obviously always had very little financing. And in parallel to that, we have water governance reforms, which is basically dealing with need trace pollution, water planning regulation, including climate change adaptation, and, and the water law to, to deal with diffuse pollution, among others. So you can see that the, the next generation plan, our national economic plans, uh, water has a very, very important role in the middle of, of it. Um, part of the this, this cross-cutting uh, digitalization of our system has to do with water. So we have 175 million euros to do with uh, the digital revolution in water. And there is a number of uh, proposals there of what we are doing. Well, they are not proposals, they are in the plans. So they are already being developed. Uh, so the question that we have here in this session is what are the macroeconomic effects? What is, what is about the economy on, the, on all these plans of Spain? Not only what 
role water has in the Spanish uh, plans, but also what uh, the water actions, what is the effect of them in the in macroeconomic terms. So, sorry, Josefina, can I, can, sorry, can I ask you to wrap up because yeah. we're running okay. out of time? Thank you. Yeah, well, well I, I will give you a couple of, of messages then. One, in the short term, basically, what we are doing is supply policies. We are improving our ways and reduction of impacts. In principle, that will not have effects on the structure of the economy. That's the idea. And there is no macroeconomic disruption either, so in the short run. The only, the only thing is that increased infrastructure investments with next generation funds will have positive macroeconomic impacts, ceteris paribus, if, you know, if there is no problems with efficiency there. In the medium and, and long term, basically, you know, the key issue is the, di the digital revolution that has multiplier effects in the economy according to our national macroeconomic modeling. So a lot of what we can do better in terms of the control of water uses, of the improvement of, uh, of the way we use water and the insurance that we have co-benefits have to do also with the fact that we are investing a lot in this digital revolution. I will leave it there for you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Josephine. And uh, thank you for giving this overview and even with this long, long-term experience you have in Spain with, uh, with water scarcity, you still have to make adjustments because of, of climate change, which is also insightful. So. I would like to turn now to Ana Cecilia Escalera. She's a hydrologist with experience on climate resilient water management and governance. She's a former advisor for the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources in Bolivia and is currently an aqua consultant collaborating with the Bolivian government in the development of the national determined contributions and that in collaboration with GIZ. And she will give us some overview of the water resilience as a national economic strategy in Bolivia. So, Ana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your introduction, Jos. I am going to share screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this session. Well, I'm going to talk about how we manage, well, how is we manage in Bolivia water resilience as a national economic strategy. Well, let's talk about a bit of the national context. Uh, Bolivia is considered one of the most vulnerable countries to natural disasters, which have been aggravated by the effects of climate change and also the densification of population living in vulnerable areas. Floods and droughts are the main hazards in the country, uh, which cause important economic losses in infrastructure and for the different productive sectors, especially the agriculture and livestock sector. During the last 15 years, we had damages valued in $3.3 billion, around 1,100 deaths and more than 3 million people affected. And in summary, 20% of the country lives in high-risk regions exposed to floods and droughts, and these regions contribute to more than 20% to the gross domestic product of the country, which is a, a really big piece. So given this context and recognizing the importance of increasing climate risk resilience, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation became a priority in the politics and the national agenda of Bolivia as a strategy to enhance the economy of the country which is embodied in the National Economic and Social Development Plan that we call the PEDES, where hydrological risk management and other measures to enhance water resilience are part of the base pillars of this plan, uh, which demonstrates that water resilience is a key economic strategy for the country. Under the PEDES lineaments, um, there are normative frameworks that have been developed to integrate these water resilience strategies in three levels. Politic through our national integral planning system, strategic through the integral development plans at sectorial and also territorial levels, and at an operative level through the pre investment and prioritization regulations. This framework allowed the government to achieve important advances in terms of an enhanced water resilience and climate change adaptation through the establishment of national strategies and actions for implementing the key mechanisms and instruments. And these implementations were led by different governmental instances, such as the Ministry of Environment and Water, Ministry of Civil Defense, and Ministry of Land and Rural Development, 
uh, with the support of international cooperation. As an example of the mechanisms and instruments implemented under the framework of enhanced water resilience, uh, we can talk about the National Disaster Early Warning System, which provides the continuous information regarding risk scenarios in the current situation in terms of loss. And since 2020, this has been uh, also implemented in terms of drought monitoring, uh, which provides information for different regions of the country. Uh, the interesting part of this uh, system is that it's a result of an interinstitutional cooperation between the Ministry of Civil Defense, Ministry of Environment and Water, and also the National Meteorological and Hydrological Service of Bolivia. The information that is reported by the system is key for decision makers in different sectors to initialize the implementation with enough anticipation of different sets of preventive and response actions against floods and droughts events, helping to substantially reduce the socioeconomic impacts in the different regions. And some examples of these actions can be measured uh, in terms of floods, the preparation of systems to protect crops against floods and also flood barriers in strategic zones, allowing the evacuation of communities and also protecting and evacuating uh, livestock, which is especially important in the Amazonian region of the country. And uh, regarding droughts, with the information provided by the drought monitor, farmers and agricultural communities are able to act with anticipation towards potential drought events through enabling, for example, rainwater harvesting systems and also make decisions regarding planting more resistant crop varieties. And this type of measures help to reduce crop losses due to water scarcity and allowing, well, allowing to reduce significantly the economic losses for this sector. And something that is extremely important, also it helps to enhance food security, which is becoming a recurrent problem in some regions of the country, given the increased frequency of drugs events that we have been observing in the last decades. Uh, well, taking water resilience as an economic strategy implies recognizing that water is transversal to the different productive sectors and therefore the economy development is strongly tied to it. So in light of this perspective, in the process of developing the second version of the Bolivian NDCs, the National Determined Contribution, which has been supported by AGUA, thanks to the efforts of the German Corporation Bolivia, look for embodying and to align the goals established in the PEDES that are extremely tied to water resilience, to the ambitions presented on the NDCs, and it also uh, was focused on identifying the new baselines that will allow the establishment of more ambitious goals, at least in terms of adaptation. And all this work was done with the perspective of making from the NDCs an instrument to support the achievement of a more resilient economy where water has a key role. Uh, well, some key messages I would like to highlight from the presentation are First, that the negative economic impacts of floods and droughts led the Bolivian government to include water-related re hazards and also climate change adaptation in the National Economic and Social Development Plan, which makes uh, water resilience a strategy to enhance the economy of the country. The establishment of national strategies aligned with the PEDES led the implementation of different instruments that allow the achievement of significant advances in enhancing water resilience and climate change adaptation. And the economic impact of this is already being seen through different productive sectors. And finally, that the second version of the Bolivian NDCs uh, was developed with a clear objective of making from the national determined contributions an instrument to achieve a resilient economy, which uh, in my personal perspective is a really uh, important step. Uh, well, Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I go back to you, Jos. Okay, thank you very much for giving this wide overview. It's, uh, I think it's important to recognize that um, um, water can also uh, have a very negative influence with, with that comes with a high cost. So um, we have to deal with these. By m making water management more resilient, we can reduce those, uh, those extra costs. Um, so now we go to Africa, uh, to Chris Baker. He's the program head for water resource management at Wetlands International. 
and recently he led the river and delta restoration and water sanitation and hygiene programs with Del wetlands international and today he will talk about the upper niger basin and the inner niger delta in mali so please chris the floor is yours okay thanks very much Jos. it's good yeah um this is rather less of a study than the other two insofar as it doesn't present uh, something which is on the way to a solution. It probably rather more reinforces the analysis that Catherine provided uh, in her overview. I want to just share with you um, a water resilience perspective of the Mali economy looking to ecosystems, water, freshwater driven ecosystems in Mali. Um, which are very important in this particular part of the world uh, of where there's water scarcity. We have a large number of systems such as the Inner Niger Delta, Lake Chad, um, the Sud, um, Senegal Delta, all large iconic uh, wetland systems which have a significant role in the macroeconomy of a country. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. I have to go the right way, right? Okay. I go right? Yeah. As probably most of you are aware, Mali is a comparatively a rather a poor country that has a lot of food insecurity, water insecurity. Um, it, on a lot of international measures, it's not doing so very well. It's experienced a lot of political turmoil the last years as well. Um, therefore, anything which affects um, the basics of life, food and water, needs to be taken very seriously. If you look at the Inner Niger Delta, a large uh, floodplain area in the middle of the country, um, it only occupies about 3% of the land area. But in terms of its GDP, it generates 8, sometimes up to 10% of the GDP. Um, it houses about 2 million people, currently about 10% of the population. And if you total all of the different sources of economic value from the delta, that includes production such as rice, fish, and cattle, together with things like the value of uh, navigation, which is very important in this country, you come up to a total of about 350 million per hectare per, per year, which I think is about 240 billion CFR in local um, money. Just briefly to go into that, the, the main sources of income and subsistence in the, in the Delta are really related to firstly um, fisheries. Uh, about 30% of people living in the area to some extent depend upon fishing for their livelihoods and for their subsistence. On a good year, when the flood is good, you get something like 130,000 tonnes per, per annum. Um, rice production, very widespread within the Delta, it follows a whole bunch of different approaches from flood recession approaches, pumped uh, water from the river, these sorts of things. Uh, but still about 30% in the, in the Delta area of the 2 million are dependent upon agriculture, uh, with 90% for uh, subsistence and your rice production in the Delta can be about 170,000 tonnes. And pastoralism, this is also hugely important. The Delta floods every year. It produces an enormous abundance of uh, grazing for sheep, goats and cattle. Um, about 40% of the people living in and around the region are herders. A lot of them passing through the region on a seasonal basis to capitalise upon the grasses released by uh, the grown under the flooding conditions. And um, this is a also vitally important prime reduction in, in the whole of Mali. All of these three um, sources of uh, production are driven by a flood. The flood comes through every year some, somewhere in the autumn, generated in the uplands in the Guinea. It passes through the area of floods, it creates conditions for fisheries, it uh, promotes growth of grazing, um, and it creates flood waters for irrigation of rice. And then uh, through November, December, it declines. Into January, February, it, it, it's disappeared again. So it's a flood-driven economy, which makes you see why water resilience in, in this, this region and to the economy of Mali is so important. If you look at this map, you see in the stars, you see the different uh, areas of uh, infrastructure which have been built or are under planning or construction. So the Fomi, Selenge, so forth, Talo, GNA. Um, what we've done is with uh, a number of partners, you saw the beginning, Potsdam Institute, uh, Wolf's Company, Altberg and Vimiga, together with our partners in the Malian government, is we've put together some scenarios to see, well, what will uh, climate change look like together with socioeconomic development investments for the future? Um, the predictions for climate change are, of course, that you'll have uh, increasing temperatures. That's to be expected, perhaps, in Mali. The rainfall picture is rather less clear. More erratic rainfall seems clear and is already being experienced. Um, but when you couple this up with some of the uh, longer-term socioeconomic development plans, you start to see quite a different picture because the combination is going to be quite, quite devastating, potentially. Um, so there's a plan to expand 100,000 hectares of irrigation near to the delta to about 450,000 hectares. Um, and a plan to create a more stable flow in the river to support that so that you can double crop. 
You've got to increase your food security at a national level by double cropping in this irrigated area. But that really comes with a lot of consequences for the people living in and around the Delta, the two million people who, who require that, and their role in the economy. And these are some of, there's a lot, of, uh, lot to say on this. But what you start to see is, um, due to the max, when we get the maximum planned irrigation combined with climate change predictions, you start to see you'll lose 10% of the economic value of the delta. And that's on an average year. You've got to remember this is a region that's characterized by high climate variability. Um, you get good flood years, you get bad flood years. And on bad years, it can be a lot worse. And when you start to look at what this means for people in terms of um, their exp exposure to drought-related risks and, and disaster years, you start to see something rather more worrying. Average years are one thing, but when you start looking at um, the, the bottom column and you look at when disaster years will occur, you, you come round that uh, you have about um, from one year in 50, you can come down to one year in 10 so you'll have a disaster year. That means something of the magnitude we saw uh, in the mid-1980s during the Great Drought. Uh, when there is widespread drought and famine in the region. But it's more than this for the economy. It's not just food. Uh, it's also about um, displacement and migration and conflict. When you look at what the impacts are upon a people of, of extremely dry years, you see that a large percentage of the resident farmers, fishers and rice growers will leave the region. They move somewhere else. And that creates its own problems. Even when you have rather less uh, wet periods, less dry periods, you create conflict between local users for water access, access to natural resources, something which is very actively happening in the Delta at the moment, and which is creating a, a breeding ground for extremism in the Delta itself. So again, another wider economic impact of not looking after the water resilience of the Delta. Now, I think I have to round off quickly here. Of course, Myself, my colleagues, our partners are doing a lot to try and raise these issues, but we're still a long way from the sorts of analysis which was presented in the previous presentations. Um, there are a lot of plans. The government has invested in a large sustainable development plan for the Delta, um, and a lot of policy commitments to restore and safeguard wetlands, but still the resources aren't flowing. They're not reaching where they need to go. At the same time, when you look at how socioeconomic planning happens in Mali, the data frameworks to capture the information just aren't there. The sorts of data you've seen there is being developed by uh, partners in development projects, not systematically by the government. It's not something that the government collects and analyzes itself. They also lack decision-making tools for planning that takes these sorts of data into account, of course. Um, one thing we really see is needed is to have a, as a new brood of what was used to be called environmental flow analyses, which makes the delta a socioeconomic actor alongside others, alongside agriculture, hydropower, etc., so that you can have trade-offs and you make good decisions. And finally, what we're really missing, and my voice is going to go with the time, is we're really missing is that in Mali you need better integrated governance. The Delta is uh, overseen by the Ministry of Sustainable Development Environment. Water does its own thing, and agriculture does its own thing, and there's no integrated planning. And this is really something, if we want to get anywhere close to the previous cases, that needs to happen. So I need to wrap up now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Very nice presentation and showing that ecosystems are maybe sometimes undervalued and uh, we have to look after them as well um so thank you thank you uh, presenters for this for this giving such a rich uh such a wealth of information in, in such a short time and which must have been a quite a challenge um so we are running out of time so i'm going directly to the closing remarks um and these will be made by tom panella He's uh, in the Asian Development Bank, Director of Environment, Natural Resources and Agriculture Division, East Asia Department, and Chair of its Water Sector Group and Committee. So please, Tom, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Jos, and thanks to all the presenters um, who gave uh, varied um, but uh, very insightful presentations. First, um, with Kathleen's overview, um, putting out a few concepts, and I think, uh, importantly, this idea of materiality gap, um, and then what we need to do um, to close that gap between economic social costs, and um, then leading into the case studies um, on how that's being handled in different countries. I think um, in the case of Spain, we saw, um, as noted by Kathleen, uh, the importance of creating redundancy for water supply in, in especially in stressed basins, um, mixing uh, surface 
the water, which is cheaper, but with other more robust and uh, redundant solutions. I think the other important lesson that we saw from Spain was how um, water is being mainstreamed um, into its overall uh, national economic and social development plans. Uh, absolutely critical and uh, Spain is coming from already a high standard of, of water management uh, but is recognizing the need that it will have to do more um, noted that 24 uh, percent of the country will be uh, more water scarce and up to foot to or 24 percent to more scarce and up to 40 percent um, so again using also technology um, and digital uh, solutions to help improve overall water management as a, as a technique um, to do this. Um, also, I think uh, the case of Bolivia uh, was also uh, quite important to see how they've explicitly recognized the nexus between economic resilience um, and water resilience and how that um, is being addressed uh, at different levels um, through uh, political, um, strategic, um, and then investment uh, at uh, both national and local scales. And I, I think that was something else that came out uh, in the presentations that many of these uh, uh, issues are highly localized in terms of impacts uh, and effects uh, on populations. And therefore, um, the solutions, uh, many of them are going to have to be at appropriate scale, many of them localized uh, to deal with the effects, um, as well as plan uh, uh, to, to manage them uh, as best as possible. Um, I also think uh, it was, important uh, point uh, in Bolivia that was touched upon by Chris's presentation, um, that you do need to have uh, cross-cutting um, governance. Uh, and in the case of Bolivia, they had uh, defense environment and hydromet working together uh, for early warning on drought. Um, and again, taking an integrated approach and in how they address it. Um, the last presentation um, from Chris, I, I think, uh, was also very interesting, different than the others, showing the importance of water and uh, its ecosystem services um, to uh, specific economic activities in the upper and inner Niger basin, um, and how the the ecosystem and its flood uh, annual flooding are, are integral uh, to the economic activities, and therefore, obviously, going forward. Uh, maintaining these floods uh, will be important uh, for current users, yet um, being forward enough looking uh, to see how uh, economic development uh, will affect these floods uh, and the people dependent on them, uh, and then trying to uh, come up with uh, uh, policy decisions uh, to, to protect the floods, but also um, highlighting the need uh, for the basis for good data and good data management, um, even without factoring in uncertainty um, to strengthen decision support. Uh, and again, ending on the importance of governance and integrated planning uh, to do this. So I, I think um, that is uh, s similar cases, uh, different aspects, but really, um, how do you look uh, at water specifically within your economy, the challenges that you'll be facing, and then coming up those with the solutions um, across policy, technology, uh, investments, um, and again, uh, having the governance to make the trade-offs uh, between these, these impacts. Um, I think I'll wrap it up there in the interest of staying on time, but um, would encourage everybody to email Yos and uh, if you have questions, and we'll make sure that it gets to the appropriate speakers. Um, and, and again, I uh, want to thank everybody for a really excellent uh, and uh, good session, um, just highlighting the different aspects of um, economic resilience. Uh, and water resilience and the interrelationship uh, 
that is uh, becoming more and more stress in light of climate change. Thank you. Thank you.